And really for me, uh, what I see beyond the frame is much more important. Does anybody know this sequence of images? Right. And again, it's sort of a, a I feel like I'm picking low-hanging fruit, but sometimes it's best to use that to give uh, simple examples of something. So this was a case where a young girl, I think she was 14 or 15 years old, was shot by police uh, just after the earthquake in Haiti. And it sort of became a controversial image, partly because it was documented by so many in a different way. And what I like about looking at this sequence of images is to me it sort of reduces what we do to a cat and mouse game. This is the mouse and I'm the cat. And I'm out there hunting and looking for my single image. My one frame that will say everything above all. But by looking for that one frame, I feel that we forget what happens beyond the frame. And in a way, this picture almost becomes redundant. It becomes useless. It doesn't communicate, and it doesn't say anything. What I see is sort of a hyper fetishization, fetishization of an individual frame, an image. That in a way, there's some kind of distortion of the reality or a distortion of the truth in our pursuit for making a wonderful image. Might as well shoot a black and white too, right? So there you are. And I'm sure we can all empathize with this on both sides, because I'm sure we've all been there in similar situations. But we have to think about what is beyond the frame. What is the periphery? To me, that is a much more interesting space to exist because periphery provides the context of what the story is about. And what I find interesting here is that we're so laser focused on one thing, we sort of forget the larger, broader spectrum of the story. And I definitely think now, and uh, coming up to this argument here, I think now as photojournalists, it is our duty not just to be mere reporters, but to be contextualizers, to look beyond the frame and to provide uh, a secondary um, uh, role or a secondary voice to a current issue or current event that's happening. And so there's this idea of flow and storage, which is a common sort of philosophical argument about the media age right now. And basically what it means, and when I read this, I got kind of excited because for a while I thought, well, photojournalism, what the hell is my point? Are we really saying anything? Really. Or are we more satisfying our, our own desires to sort of be and do and get out there? Play the cat and mouse game. But I was reading this uh, book about the hyperaccumulation of image where most people say, yeah, there's six billion images made a day or something like that. So who does that, how does that leave us? Well, to me, it's very interesting when you sort of talk about flow. So the flow of images that are moving every day we're taking images. Oksana, take one right now. Add to the six billion of the day, right? Which is fine. But I think our role and our task and our duty as photographers, documentarians, video artists, whatever it is that you want to call yourself, is this idea of storage. What do you think storage really means? Hmm? Archive. Archive. And what is archive? It means you sort of reach into that flow and you grab something and you set it down and you say, this is the something that needs care. This is something that I can talk about. So we let the flow go past us, but every now and then, now our job, I think, as a photojournalist, this is flow. And so at some point, we need to stop and take this idea of the storage, the archive, whatever that is but to take it and provide a context to a larger issue, story, theme, whatever it is that you so choose to do. Uh, as you can see, I like typologies because I'm fascinated by, especially now, I like to go on Google and every now and then I'll just type in a very vague image search. Uh, and one of the image searches I just did recently, actually, was um, with a friend of mine. Uh, she's working in Donbass. And uh, we were sort of looking at sort of what we, the so-called professionals, take of images in Donbass. 
And then we wanted to mirror that against, well, what about the people who actually live there? What are they doing? Uh, and so we just went onto Instagram and we typed two very simple image key searches. I'm not going to show you because I don't have the, the images with me, but in, if you type into Google Donetsk, what comes up? Take a guess. Very easy. South. What? South. In a way. Girls. And if you type Donetsk into Google, news photographs come up of destroyed buildings, screaming babushkas, bloody arms, decapitated heads, war, basically. If you go into Instagram and you type Donetsk, the exact same search, very, very, very different results come up. Selfies, people eating pizza. Lots of selfies with their kittens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then every now and then, an image of the war sort of permeates, but it's never the focus. And I thought, always thought that was very interesting, the way the sort of, how we as journalists interpret a space or a story is very different than how people who actually live there interpret the story. Um, so these are a series of images from Euromaidan 2004. Again, I just went onto Google and I typed Euro Maidan 2014. And I just grabbed a bunch of images. And I was there only later because, as I said before, I spent pretty much 10 years in Russia and Ukraine. And I lived in Kiev for a number of years. And I still have uh, many friends in Kiev. And it's a place close to me. I feel like I was a citizen of the city. And so watching what was happening afar on the news was really troubling to me. And I remember I emailed my friend uh, Vanya. I said, what the hell's going on in Kiev? It's all in flames. I couldn't believe it. And Vanya said to me, ah, Don, don't worry. It's just, just news. No problem. I was like, what do you mean no problem? The city's on fire. He said, ah, it's my Don, you know. Uh, and so, again, it was another instance where I thought the news is sort of completely uh, irrelevant to the actual news. I was just in Paris last week on Friday during the, uh, the attacks and inundated with texts and emails and it was very nice, are you okay, stay safe, everything all right? I had no idea what was happening on Friday night. Not a clue, not a clue. Lots of uh, police cars driving around. It wasn't until sort of later on when I realized the magnitude of it. But where I was, wasn't very close to it. And then even the next day, people were out you know, in the cafes and the shopping. And so watching what was happening on the news and actually watching the reality are two very separate things. It also happened when I was in Georgia during the, um, the uh, war with Russia. Totally, totally different than what was uh, experienced and then what was actually reported. So these kinds of dichotomies or these shifts and has really sort of interested me and how is it in the news, the so-called journalists, get it so wrong? Uh, and what can we do as photojournalists to get it right? And anyways, these are just a bunch of images of flames and fire. And I'm sure actually most of you or a lot of you will probably experience this event in some capacity, much more so than my colleagues or friends in America or Canada because you're geographically closer. But there was a lot of fire, and there were a lot of flames, but the city wasn't burning um, as it was perceived to be. And I thought it was very interesting that, as again, as a photojournalist, we're sort of always looking for the peak moment. This is like sports photography, basically, here. Everybody has the guy perfectly cocked, that Molotov cocktail is just about to launch. Oh, I got it. But to me, it doesn't say anything. What's happening beyond the frame of this? I guarantee you, if you turn around, where is this? Yeah, this is right by Lomonosovo, right? So if you turn around, the stadium is probably there. And there was a hill, I remember, with all the birch trees. And I remember once walking up to the main barricade, looking up in the birch trees, people standing and watching, just like a theater. You have the main actors, you have the police, and the, the protests down in the middle. The hill with the spectators up behind and they were all dressed and ready to perform the theater of news for us. And I think Oksana said it earlier, news begins, what did you say? News begins when the journalists arrive and news ends war. when the war. war. That's right. And my good friend of mine in uh, Ukraine said to me, were you there? You said that. Arthur, remember in Amsterdam? 
you, no, Arthur. About friends, colleagues in Ukraine who were worried. Yeah, what we what we gonna do when the war will end? Because why? Because they're they're working. Suddenly they're working. A good friend of mine, a young kid, he's 24 years old, is working kind of as a fixer over there, and he said to me the other day, I'm really worried. How am I going to be able to work? Nobody's coming. And I thought, that is such an insane way to sort of view things, but that is what we perpetuate as journalists within a larger sort of mainstream media context. Uh, it comes and goes with us. And so thinking of these images in Maidan, I was getting really irritated and mad. The other interesting thing I, I, I thought was uh, fascinating was Euro Maidan was reduced to two tropes, fire and ice. I'm sure you all probably saw the blogs and the news online, Kia, fire and ice, and they would show these photographs of the fire, and it was the middle of winter, minus 20 degrees, and the statue was covered with water and it was ice, but it was one bloody statue. And of course it was cold, you can see the snow. But these pictures then became oranges and they became blues and they became this sort of very simple trope of good versus evil, fire versus ice. Um, and so one day just sort of walking around, I saw these bottles, thousands of them, tens of thousands, if not probably hundreds of thousands of bottles. And these factory lines, of people making Molotov cocktails, which I thought was sort of interesting just as, just as an aside. And I was also sort of intrigued by the way the protesters used these very primitive tools and these very primitive uh, devices to essentially defeat uh, the government and the police forces. Uh, and of course, all things went to shit at the end. But for a while there, I was impressed with the way uh, these primitive devices were kind of used incredibly effectively. Um, and I don't know where I came from. I just sort of had the day one day and I just started taking bottles, put them on a white backdrop and photographed them. And to me what I liked was this sort of unique individuality of each bottle, each sort of rag sort of popping apart that these are kinds of metaphors of the individual that needs to take up this primitive arm and fight. So that is sort of the beginning of a way that I see we can look at something. It doesn't mean you always have to make something for the sake of making it different, but I highly believe that the form of the story will dictate to you the voice it will become. I think right now we expect, say, to go into a situation and do this. Immediately this is in our minds because we have this sort of a preconceived set of guidelines or values or rules that says in photojournalism, this is how we do it. But I think if we stop looking at, well, this is how we do it, I'm gonna to react to a situation aesthetically and instead really investigate, then maybe we can sort of find a voice that is appropriate to the story. Now I'm just going to show you some other photographers' works that I like, that I find intriguing. They might not be necessarily successful, but at least they're about different ways of investigating a story. And to me that's the most important thing, is the story comes first. My uh, aesthetic representation of it should never supersede um, that voice. And so this is a, a photographer, Glenna Gordon, from working in Nigeria. You've seen this story? These are kidnapped artifacts of the girls uh, from Boko Haram in Nigeria. This actually won second prize in uh, World Press this year, and we had a huge internal debate about this work, where half of the people did not see this as news photography. So why is this not news photography? Kidnapped girls, Nigeria, huge issue, right? They like the tropes. Yeah, exactly. Like, what are we expecting? Screaming uh, children in the village or something? I'm not really sure. And so we ended up uh, awarding it, thankfully. I was happy for that. Because I think it's, it's an imaginative approach and a very difficult news story to how do you visualize something that is unphotographable, essentially. And it's very much, I mean, just, uh, what was it, just two or three days ago, a girl blew herself up, right? 11-year-old girl, I think, in... Uh, Northern Nigeria killed a couple people. It's a new story. 
An issue that I'm interested in is uh, collaboration. What happens when you start collaborating with your subjects? For so long, journalists are told, stay arm's length away. You have to be objective. You can't get involved with your subjects. So what happens when you get involved in your subjects? Anybody know who Eric Gottesman is, American photographer? Uh, about 15 years ago, he traveled to Ethiopia and essentially started a collective. It started with six kids who were all HIV positive, and he essentially worked with them taking pictures. But over the 15 years, the group grew exponentially, and he just became sort of more of a, uh, an enabler, sort of pushing and uh, prodding and leading these kids to sort of examine their own disease and the, examine their... Uh, sort of stereotype or the perception within Ethiopian society and allowed them to sort of use photography to explore their world, explore the stigma of HIV in Africa, etc. And I think this is a really interesting project because, again, when you think of HIV AIDS Africa, it's probably a six-year-old child that's in a hospital somewhere and dying. And so, in a way, we kind of lose our connection to what the greater story is. Once again, I think the journalist sort of imposes their own uh, values upon it without sort of considering their subject. And so collaboration, you can actually have the voice of your subject, which is really what we need to be doing. So that to me is a successful representation, I, and I think great journalism in the end. Anybody know this project? This is a Spanish photographer. You haven't seen their faces. So essentially, he's photographed the 100 most powerful people in the city of London. And the idea sort of came from uh, the riots in Tottenham. What was that, like 2010 or 11, 12, something like that, where the police started handing out these images of black kids, visible minorities with hoodies, using the surveillance cam. You know, London is one of the most surveilled cities in the world. And just sort of handing them out, saying, have you seen these faces? These are, these are people who might, not are, but might have been involved in the riot. So he was kind of interested in that idea of surveillance and how surveillance can sort of change your perception of uh, an event. So he found out who the 100 most powerful people in the city of London is and re-photographed them and sort of gave them a surveillance treatment. And I like this project because it's about activism. It's very much taking a point of view. So why can't you take a point of view as a documentarian or as a journalist? To me, I think it becomes a much more powerful statement about this inequality and the power corruptions that society is sort of uh, imposing upon us. This is a young Dutch photographer, and I love this project. I think it's absolutely fascinating, and he's completely exposing all of our uh, preconceptions about Africa and who Africans are. So again, as I said before, I love to just make very simple Google searches because it sort of sums everything up in one word. I typed in Maasai. This is the first batch of images that comes up. We all know who the Maasai are, right? And actually, before I even showed that, I'm sure most people were thinking, oh, guys with the red shawls. Oh, yeah. This is what we all imagine. And we all imagine this because these are the only images we see. But what happens when you see this? Is this the Maasai? Is this the Maasai? They are because they're Maasai. That's where they come from. So because you sort of choose to appear in a certain way for a certain image, i.e. this. Hmm? Yeah, I'll explain this a little bit because it's a really interesting project. So, hmm? Jan Hook. John Hook. Um, so basically he found Maasai and he gave them three options for photographs or he asked them, I'm going to take your picture in three ways. You need to tell me how you would like to be photographed. So again, an idea of collaboration. So of giving the voice to the subject and allowing them to sort of dictate the way the photograph needs to be taken. So here we have Eliza, who's 31. His writing is really bad, but I'll try. Um, makes money because she always wins when she plays pool against men. So she likes uh, to be photographed as a gangster girl 
and doesn't like to be photographed with a lot of makeup or naked. And then he asked, so he did the photographs, and then he asked them, what's your first choice, your second choice, and your third choice? So the big one is the one she liked. And these are all absolutely how they envision themselves, which is a very different imagining how we envision them. And so I like the fact that he turns the table on our own sort of perceptions and misconceptions of a tribe. So again, here we, uh, he wants to be photographed uh, as a witch doctor and doesn't want to be, pho he also doesn't want to be photographed naked, so two out of three don't, <laughs> you know, I don't blame him. So Maria, she's an animal keeper, she likes silver and wants to be photographed happy and smiling, and she doesn't like sad photos. And it's a great little book, if you can find it, it's cheap, it's only like 25 euros. Wonderful book, again, another image. Um, another. So completely defying the typical tropes that we assign to what, say, an African should be perceived as. Uh, now I want to go down a very dirty road, the idea of staging, oh no. The world has ended. This is a Belgian photographer, Max Pinkers, who was photographing in Mumbai. And uh, he made a, a bunch of trips there. And at one point, he sort of realized that what he was doing was completely irrelevant to the idea of the city. And he was very intrigued in Mumbai as sort of a character, as a voice. But the way he was photographing at first, he didn't feel it was sort of capturing its true essence of what this kind of urbanity was about. So he went back and started noticing how prevalent this idea of Bollywood culture, movies, etc., are within the city on a kind of subliminal level. So a lot of these photographs, in fact, I think all of them are all actors, and he lit them. Um, they're not professional actors, but I think they were all like extras and sort of from the sidelines of the movie industry. And so in a way, what I like about this project is that he's kind of manipulating the ideas of the sense of uh, living, so to speak, of a daily life, uh, subverting the notion of what it means to, say, be a citizen within a, a larger context. But also he was talking about the idea of the hyper-spirituality within a city, and it doesn't just mean Bombay, but any city, the sort of psychogeographic uh, approach that you take uh, within any environment. And to me, I think it's great, because I don't care if they're not really tugging on something in real life, because what it does is it sort of addresses, again, this sort of larger, say, cultural issue about the city of Mumbai. So therefore, by not telling the truth, you actually get at a greater truth. Um, lastly, this is a project that doesn't even really use photographs, but uses the idea of communication, I think, to a very powerful degree. And in the end, photojournalism really isn't necessarily about how great your photograph is, but I also think it's very much about how do you communicate with people. In the end, our responsibility is to an audience. And if I can communicate an issue or a topic or whatever to an audience, then you've become a successful photojournalist. So in my own career, my own practice, I think, what's my responsibility? Who do I have to uh, communicate with, and how can I communicate this? So Anastasia, uh, as an aside, I can tell you, was given a short assignment by National Geographic to go to Donbass and photograph in the war not this past summer, but the summer before, so the summer 2014. Slavyansk, all that stuff. So she went, and again, it was sort of what we were talking about, that even though war is sort of happening, you can hear it, you can see the effects of it, she saw somebody getting married. They went to a cafe and had shitty pizza because they put mayonnaise on top of it. All these kinds of things were actually happening within the city at the time. And she thought, well, this is okay. Well, this is a very interesting topic. So she filed her pictures of people getting married, going to the pizza restaurant, people watching TV, walking down the street. And of course, the war sort of infects uh, uh, the images. And when she delivered them to uh, the magazine, they said, no, 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 this is all wrong. This is, this, is, this is not what we wanted. This is not war. And Anastasia says, what do you mean this is not war? This is, this is, I'm there. My feet are on the ground. I can smell it. 
no, 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 it's terrible if they can the, the, uh, the uh, story because it wasn't sort of uh, fitting a preconception of what we are, as editors say, or whomever, afar, are uh, dictating of what uh, a war should look like. And so this really annoyed her, and she went back uh, this summer, this past summer, uh, she found these postcards that say, welcome to Donetsk, Gondom, just some nice pretty thing, here's some cherry blossoms, and had this idea to sort of start cataloging all of the people that have been killed in uh, the war since it began. So from the good side, from the bad side, from the, this side, from that side, every name, and every name sort of becomes just a name, regardless of uh, who you are, so to speak. And then through social media, she basically said, I have these postcards, uh, send me your address. So through social media, she started creating a database of um, people willing to receive a postcard. I don't know if anybody here received a postcard. Yeah, Merlin, I received a postcard. And on the back of the postcard was just somebody's name, uh, the day they were killed, and that's it. And then what started happening, and this, is the, uh, this sort of goes to the idea of collaboration, but also uh, how uh, you can sort of use social media as a new audience that is much more accessible. Uh, people started photographing the postcards when they received them. This is something that she didn't count on. So then she started reposting these pictures on her Instagram account and her Facebook account, and it sort of blossomed into this uh, kind of ethereal database. And so now she's actually... I think she's tracked down 996, and the interesting thing about this story is that people are coming to her now to say, can we have a copy of your list? Because there is no definitive list of all those who've been killed. You know, say the Ukrainians keep track of those who were killed in Ukraine, and then maybe the people in the Donbass on the Russian side, and then the MH17, et cetera. So there are all these very disparate lists, but she's one of the few that actually has uh, a list. So again, the power of journalism is actually quite potent when I think you use it in, uh, in, a, in a way which engages with your audience and uses your responsibility as the communicator. Um, so she's still working on that. She wants to do all 4,000. I have no idea how she's going to do that. But uh, so that's some work of just photographers without sort of the context of uh, where the work goes. I think most of us sort of exist within this realm, right? Where we make something, but then what? What happens with our work? And as I was talking about before, earlier, the idea of the flow and the storage. So now we really have to think of storage, I think, on a literal level. We have these images. Now what? 